Hey guys, in this video we're going to be looking at the chemistry section of your OCR gateway, predicting and identifying products and reactants. This is an absolutely brilliant unit, I love the chemistry in here. Now to make sure that you love and understand all the chemistry in here, there's a free checklist on my website in the revision guide so you can go through and tick off everything you don't know, identify the areas that you're not so sure about and then use the videos to fill in those gaps. This beautifully coloured periodic table is because of lots of different groups, lots of different categories on the periodic table. Group number one are also known as alkali metals. Group number two are the alkali earth metals or alkaline metals. Group seven are the halogens. And group eight are the noble gases. The big chunk in the middle are the transition metals. The group right on the far right hand side are group 8 or group 0, these are the noble gases. They have a full outer shell. And because they have a full outer shell they don't want to gain or lose any electrons, which means they are really, really unreactive. And because they are unreactive they actually have quite a lot of uses. Helium we use in balloons. And they are also used in neon lights, as you can see here in the amazing city of Osaka. Your alkali metals react very violently with water, and this is where you're going to see some flames coming from, some different colours coming from. This is one of the things that we use to make the different colours in fireworks. So the lovely, lovely lilac frame from potassium we can use in fireworks. If you've seen these in school, these are soft grey metals which are easily cuttable. They need to be kept in oil so it doesn't react with oxygen or with the water in the air because it's a very, very violent reaction. When the metal reacts with oxygen, we're going to get a metal oxide, which if you've seen these in school, when it was cut, it was shiny, but it soon started to dull. The dullness is the metal oxide. The metal plus water is going to form metal hydroxide. This gives it its name, it's alkaline metal, because uh, the metal hydroxide is going to be alkaline. You can see that by the change in indicator, if that's what your teacher did. And you will also notice this is a very exothermic reaction. It released a lot of heat, it also released hydrogen gas. That's what the fizzing was. The reactivity is most reactive at the bottom. and least reactive at the top. Things at the bottom are going to have a low melting point or boiling point and a higher melting point or boiling point at the top. Alkali metals want to lose an electron and the ones at the bottom are most reactive because there is more shielding between the, atom that, the electron that they want to use and the positive nucleus in the middle. Moving over one group to group 7, we have the halogens. We are still in the non-metals. And these are going to go around as diatomic molecules, which means their formula is going to be for chlorine gas, Cl2, fluorine gas, F2, bromine gas, Br2. They're going to go around together in pairs. Because they only want to gain one electron, a nice easy way for them to do that is sharing an electron with something else that is the same. So fluorine here can easily gain an extra electron by sharing it with another fluorine. They are highly reactive because they only want to gain one electron. And the most reactive ones are going to be at the top. Boiling point is going to change as we move down the group. So things are going to have a low boiling point or a low melting point are going to be at the top. High boiling points or high melting points are going to be at the bottom. When they react, they're going to gain an electron. Meaning they're going to form minus one ions. And gaining an electron is a reduction. But 
They are going to react violently and rapidly with group 1 metals because group 1 metals want to lose 1 electrons. For example, sodium, which is a soft grey metal, will react very violently, very readily with chlorine, which is a yellow gas, to form sodium chloride, which is a white powder or salt. A more reactive element will displace a less reactive element. So here we have uh, sodium iodide reactive with bromine. Iodine is here below bromine on the periodic table, so bromine is more reactive. So it will displace um, iodine in the compound, forming sodium bromide and iodine. Whereas if you try and react bromine gas with sodium chloride, chlorine is higher than bromine on the periodic table, so it's more reactive. You are going to get no reaction because bromine cannot displace chlorine out of this. These are commonly known as displacement reactions. The halogens are mostly used for sterilising things, for example chlorine, you're commonly going to know that as uh, from, from swimming pools. Halogens want to gain one electron, so the most reactive ones are at the top, that's where there's least shielding between the electron they want to gain and the nucleus. Transition metals are in the middle, their properties are that they are hard, shiny and are good conductors. These are basically your traditional metals, so any property of traditional metal, you can generally associate it with a transition metal. Um, because of their properties, they can be used in jewellery, in wires, or in saucepans. Um, and because they get all these different colours, they can be used for things like stained glass or for coating statues. Here the Statue of Liberty has a copper coating. Copper, uh, the transition metal compounds are generally going to be blue or a bluey green. Iron 2 is light green. Iron 3 is an orangey brown, a rust colour. And cobalt is a really lovely deep rich blue. In an experiment, when you see bubbles coming off something, chances are it's going to be one of these four types of gases. Hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide or chlorine gas. To test for hydrogen gas, it is a squeaky pop. To test for oxygen gas, it is going to relight a glowing splint. Carbon dioxide turns lime water cloudy and chlorine gas is going to bleach damp litmus paper if you're going to use sodium hydroxide to test for your positive ions we need to look at the ionic equations and we need to look at the precipitates Testing for aluminium with sodium hydroxide is going to give you a white precipitate, which is then going to dissolve. Testing for calcium with sodium hydroxide is just going to give you a white precipitate, which will not dissolve. Testing for magnesium with sodium hydroxide will give you a white precipitate, so in this circumstance you would need another test to differentiate between calcium and magnesium. Copper ions will give you a light blue precipitate, iron 2 ions will give you a grey green precipitate, and iron 3 ions will give you an orange precipitate. For the ionic equations, we have our hydroxide ion and then our metal ions, and you are expected to know all of these. Then you just need to make sure your number of negative hydroxide ions is equal to the number of positive ions. So aluminium is three positive, so it needs three negative ions to become neutral overall. Calcium is two positive, so it needs two negative ions to become neutral overall. Magnesium, OH2. Calcium, OH2. Iron OH2, Iron 3 OH3. If you want to test something for a carbonate ion, you need to add hydrochloric acid, set up a delivery tube so any gas evolved will be collected down into lime water, and if it's carbon dioxide, the lime water will go cloudy. 
If you want to test the sample to see if it contains sulfite ions, you need to add hydrochloric acid, you need to add barium chloride, and if it contains sulfite ions, you will get a white precipitate formed. If you want to test for halide ions, you can add silver nitrate, and chloride ions will give a white precipitate. Bromide ions will give a cream precipitate, and iodide ions will give a yellow precipitate. Yellow, but not as yellow as the walls of my lab used to be. Now this can sometimes be a very, very subtle difference and the best way to do it is by comparing it with the other things. I love flame tests. They are so, so pretty. You need to know that lithium will burn with the crimson flame, sodium will burn with the yellow flame, potassium will burn with the lilac flame, calcium with the red flame, barium with the green flame, even though it doesn't look green, and copper is going to burn with the blue-green flame. In some cases, doing tests in class might not be as good as using an instrumental method. Instrumental methods can be faster, they can be more accurate, and they are unbiased. Ouch. Mm, love you too, Krim.